Hi, my name is Gabriel Foley, and I'm the coordinator for the Maryland and DC Breeding Bird Atlas. I'm gonna give you a bit of an introduction to what atlasing is. And as you can see from my background, I'm coming to you live from the shore. We've got some buffle heads there and some boat-tailed grackles, and there's even a, a long-tailed duck. So it's gonna be a good time. Uh, I've got some slides to share with you, so I will do that right now. Uh, there we go. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about breeding bird atlases and then what exactly the data from an atlas sh can show and how you can get involved with this project. A breeding bird atlas is about documenting the distribution and abundance of birds within a particular region. This is usually a state or a province. In this case, it's Maryland and DC. And it usually occurs for a set period of time. Normally that's five years. Uh, and usually it's repeated, typically at intervals of about 20 years. So this is the third one that we're on to. There have been two prior atlases done in Maryland and DC. And the data are collected by volunteers. Uh, almost completely. In the last atlas, there were over a thousand people involved with collecting the data. And the results can be applied to a variety of things such as identifying important bird areas or species at risk um, or just general research uses. You know, if you want to find out if a bird is breeding or not, you can go out and you can find the bird's nest. And that is I mean, you can't argue with that, right? That bird is breeding there. You found the nest. But birds are also really good at hiding their nests, and nests are hard to find. So we can use the behavior of a bird to try and figure out how likely it is that the bird is breeding. So if you see a bird, um, you don't know if it's breeding or not. But if you see it singing, well, that's, that's a little bit better of an indication. If it's displaying... That's even better evidence. And if you see it building a nest or if you find eggs, that's a great indication that the bird is breeding there. You've confirmed it breeding. So we use this behavioral evidence to try and figure out how likely it is that a, a bird is breeding at a particular place or not. And each of these observations that you make about bird behavior, they're each linked to a particular place and a particular time. So you are able to, to map out where birds are breeding and when they're doing it. I'll give you a really brief history on breeding bird atlases. Uh, they started in Europe. Uh, the very first one was done in Britain and Ireland. And a guy by the name of Chandler Robbins, he heard about this and thought it was a great idea and brought it over to North America. He ran a couple of uh, tests in Howard and Montgomery County in Maryland uh, to see if breeding bird atlases would work, and they did. So the project was expanded statewide in the 80s. Uh, that's when the first uh, breeding bird atlas was done here. And then a second one was done in the 2000s. We're now on to the third, which started January of 2020. Atlases are typically repeated about every 20 years. And this repetition allows you to show how things have changed over time, right? We have a snapshot of how the birds were breeding uh, and where they were in the 80s, another snapshot in the 2000s, and now we've got a third one. This will show you changes in timing, distribution, and abundance of the regions breeding birds, as well as changes in habitat and land use, and that can all inform your conservation priorities. So the basic unit of measurement for conducting an atlas is, is using a, a block grid. So you can see here we've got a grid of blocks laid over the region of Maryland and DC. There's about 1,300 of them. Each block is about three miles by three miles. And observers go into every one of these blocks and they identify all the birds that they can find and they try to determine how likely it is that the bird is breeding there. And when the project is done, you have a map 
for each species of birds across the whole region. So for this atlas, our objectives are to find all of the species of birds that are breeding within Maryland and DC. To do this, we want to have uniform coverage across the region. That means meeting a minimum threshold of effort in every single one of those 1,300 and some blocks. We want to find out how many birds there are in general, what's the relative abundance of each species, and we want to know where are they located. Uh, the birds aren't spread out evenly across the region. Some areas have more species uh, than others. We also have a list of priority species. These are, these are birds that uh, are listed in the State Wildlife Action Plan as uh, at risk, and we want to gather some additional information on these species. We also uh, want to collect additional information for public and conservation lands. Um, it's a lot easier to manage the lands with data that's, um, that has been collected just from that location. So we're encouraging observers to make checklists that contain birds that are only from within a park boundary. And we also, you know, we have a great opportunity to raise awareness for conservation with this project. Um, I think that atlasing is just one of the most fantastic opportunities to go out and really get to know the common birds that are in your backyard. Um, you, you have to pay attention to their behavior to be able to determine whether they're breeding or not. And this really teaches you a lot and it gets you into places that you might not normally go to. Uh, you never know what you're going to discover when you're out atlasing. It's, it's really exciting. So every bird that you see is given a, a breeding status and there's four of them. If you just see a bird and it's not doing anything particularly related to breeding, it's just an observed bird, you saw it. If you've got a bird that's in the right habitat uh, or if it's singing, that's a possible breeding bird. It's not very good evidence of breeding, but uh, it's better than nothing. And so that bird is possible. Now, if you see a pair of birds or a bird has been singing in the same spot for a while, um, or if you see uh, a bird that is chasing another bird of the same species away, these are all indications that the bird is probably breeding there. So that's a probable breeding status. And then if you find a nest or eggs or chicks, um, that's confirmed breeding. Can't get much better than that. Now, to come up with these breeding statuses, we use breeding codes. And this is how you identify the actual behavior that you see. So for possible breeders, right? If you have a bird that's in the right habitat or that's singing, then you would code it with code H or code S. Um, probable, if you find a pair that gets code P, there's, there's a couple of dozen of, of these uh, breeding codes and most of them are are pretty self-explanatory um, but there's definitions in the atlas handbook that you can look at um, that show you exactly when to use each of the codes so this is a this is a map of uh, where upland sandpipers nested in the second breeding bird atlas here in maryland and dc um, this was from the 2000s. So the big one here, you can see there's, there's a green block here in Garrett County in the west. This was the only location where upland sandpipers were found nesting in the second atlas. Now, this smaller map down here, this is uh, these red triangles. These are locations where upland sandpipers were found nesting in the first atlas but they were not found in the second atlas. So upland sandpipers shrunk across, their, their distribution shrunk across Maryland and DC. This is pretty much due to the loss of grasslands for them to nest in their grassland bird. Um, and this trend has only continued since the early 2000s. So we don't, we don't know if we'll find them for this atlas. 
Now, compare that to something like the tree swallow. They're found all across the region, but uh, look at this map, uh, the smaller one down here, all these green circles. The green circles are locations where they were not found in the first atlas, but they were found in the second atlas. You can see that tree swallows just exploded across the region, and this probably has a lot to do with people putting up bluebird boxes. Tree swallows love nesting in bluebird boxes. This is one of my favorite comparisons uh, in the, the whole atlas, uh, the maps of Carolina chickadees and black-capped chickadees. Carolina and black-capped chickadees are pretty similar birds. They, you know, you might not think that they would have such distinct um, habitat differences, but if you look at the, this distribution map for each of these, man, the line between Washington and Allegheny County is just pretty much where Carolina stop and black, chap, black cap start. It's, it's fantastic. This is a great example of the kind of uh, data that an, a breeding bird atlas can show you. I love this. This is a map from the second breeding bird atlas uh, of species richness. So that's just how many species were found at a location. In each of these blocks, the darker the blue is, the more birds, the more different species that were found in those blocks. You can see that up here in Garrett County, there's, there's quite a lot of species, that makes sense. And down here in the southeast, there's quite a lot, that also makes sense. And here in the center of the state, in Howard County, it's also quite dark, there's a lot of species there. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, if you look here at this map, this is an effort map. So, same idea, the darker the blue, the more effort that was recorded searching for birds in each of the blocks. And you can see that here in Howard County, there was a ton of effort that got put into trying to find different birds. And that's fantastic. Howard County worked really hard um, and found a lot of stuff inside their county. Um, but what that, what that does is it makes Howard County look like it's this biodiversity hotspot compared to the surrounding counties, which isn't necessarily the case. So for this atlas, we absolutely do not want to discourage people from going out and atlasing as much as they want in the blocks that are close to home. But as you can see on this map in the last atlas, there were a lot of places that didn't get nearly as much coverage um, as places where more people lived. Um, and they're not even that far away. So we would love to see, if folks have time and opportunity, we'd love to see people going out for a day or two to a block that is further away from where they live and try to get, um, try to, try to get more effort in some of these blocks that are further away. And the cool part about doing that too is that you have the opportunity to find things in these blocks that nobody else has found before because nobody else has really been looking for it there. That's kind of exciting. So to collect the data for the atlas, in the past, you just wrote it down on a card and that card got entered into uh, a computer. But now uh, it's a little bit different. We're using a data collection platform called eBird. eBird is a community science project that uh, it's the world's largest biodiversity data collection platform that um, is done by volunteers. And basically, folks go out and they record their location and how long they look for birds, and then they record all the birds that they find while they're looking. This is perfect for what an atlas needs. An atlas wants you to go out and wants to know how long you were looking for, where you were, and what birds you found. So eBird and Atlasing mesh together perfectly. Um, now, if you, the, you can, you can uh, download an app onto your phone and you can use that, or you can just use uh, the website to enter the data. And I know a lot of people don't like looking at their phone or have trouble typing in with the buttons. That's totally okay. We have block data sheets that you can download and fill out. You know, trusty old pencil and clipboard works great. 
feel free to do that. Um, you can enter all of your data sheets you, um, through the website. You don't have to use a phone. Now, the only thing to know is if you're going to submit a checklist to eBird for the Atlas, you want to make sure that it goes into what's called the Atlas portal. Now, the portal is just a label that gets affixed to every observation that comes in that says, okay, this observation, this is intended for the breeding bird atlas. That way we know that you collected the data for the atlas, not just uh, in general for eBird. So to do that, you can, you can change the portal on your app, on your phone, through the settings, um, or you can just go to the website address to do it on your computer. Um, if, you, if you go into the handbook, there are instructions and screenshots about how to do this. One of the exciting things about being able to use a platform like eBird is that it gives you the ability to explore the data as they come in in real time um, or very close to it. So this is, this is a map here of all of the blocks in Maryland that have effort so far. So where have people in the three months since we started, where have people been looking for birds? You can see that here. And the darker that the square is, the more effort that's been put into it. If you want to find this map, all you have to do is go here on the website to explore and then uh, click on the Atlas effort map that pops up and you'll get this map. Um, you can use this drop down menu to pick between a couple of different things, including coded species. This is where all of the breeding codes that have come in for different species are found. The, the lighter the color, the more codes, breeding codes that have been recorded for that block. Um, or you can also go to this explore and you can search a species map and you can search for one particular species. This is, this is a map of Carolina wrens. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you can do. I would really encourage you to go and play around with it. It's pretty neat. Now, there are a few best practices that you should take part in when you're submitting uh, a checklist to eBird. So each checklist, whether you're doing it on your phone or whether you're doing it on the computer, each checklist should be short. So uh, you'll probably make multiple checklists while you're out atlasing. They should be less than three miles, ideally. The reason for this is because the blocks are three miles by three miles. And you don't want to cross the block boundaries because if you keep a list of the birds that you see um, from two different blocks, when you go to submit it, it'll only show up as the birds from one block. So you will have seen birds from block A and block B, but you'll be reporting all those birds just for block A. And we want to avoid that. So keeping the checklist under three miles really helps uh, minimize the chance of you crossing block boundaries. It's also really useful though for finding habitat or bird community associations. So if you have a really long checklist, uh, we don't know whether the ducks that you saw were from the forest or the field or the pond. If you saw, if you, if you keep a short checklist though, um, then we know that the ducks that you saw, they were in the pond. Um, this is actually really important for when it comes to uh, analyzing the data at the end of the atlas. So each checklist should also include the precise location of where you were, not just the block that you were in. So in the past, you just had to record the block. Now we want to know where in the block you were. Again, this helps with things like uh, what kind of habitat the birds are associated with or what kind of bird community the birds are associating with. We also want to know the date and how long you were looking for birds. Um, the nice thing is if you use the app on your phone, the location, the date, the duration, 
that's all recorded automatically by the app, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, we also want you to record how many people you were out atlasing with. More eyes just means it's easier to spot more birds. So if you're going out with a couple people, make sure that you put that down. And then the fun stuff. We want to know what species you saw, how many of them there were, and what the breeding codes were. Safe dates. Okay, if you've been involved with atlases before, you might have heard the term safe date. If you haven't, well, you, you probably haven't heard of what a safe date is. Basically, a safe date range is the time of a year when the migrants of a species are gone. So all the birds of that species that you see within safe dates, you can assume that they are probably breeding there. They're not migrating. Safe dates generally start in the spring and they generally end in the fall. Now, safe dates are not the same thing as the nesting time for birds. They're the time when the migrants of a species are no longer present in a region. If you see a bird, you can assume that it's there to breed. Breeding still occurs outside of safe dates. So you need to be aware of the behavior of each bird that you see, uh, even if it's not within safe dates. And you can find these safe dates in the handbook, um, or there's a, there's a shorter version of the handbook for in the field so that you can take it with you. Um, the main thing where safe dates come into play is for using weak codes like possible codes codes that don't really tell you a whole lot about whether the bird is breeding or not we ask that you don't use possible codes um, for bird behavior outside of safe dates so this is just things like the bird is in the right habitat or the bird is singing so here's an example um, for eastern bluebirds here in maryland ndc Safe dates for them start May 1st. Um, so be before May 1st, um, there's a lot of nesting that is going on. You can see each one of these blue dots. This is the date that the egg, the first egg was laid. And you can see the, the higher that the dot is, the more nests there were that were laid on that date. So you can see that mid-April, there's a lot of nesting that's going on for eastern bluebirds, but this is still a couple weeks before safe dates have started. If you were ignoring bluebirds until May 1st, you would be missing a large chunk of breeding behavior that's going on. You can see with this timeline as well that uh, there's a lot of overlap here between when bluebirds are migrating, right? That's the light green bar. And when they're nesting, that's the dashed dark green bar. You can see that they start nesting in uh, late February, early March, um, and they don't stop migrating until mid-April. So you want to be aware of the behavior of birds that, that you're looking at at all times of year. Now, each one of the 1,302 blocks has a, a set of targets that we want to hit by the end of the atlas. This helps to make sure that the, um, the effort that we have of people looking for birds is even across the whole region and that we've gotten into each and every part of the state of the region. So we want to have about 20 hours of effort spread over the five years. That's not 20 hours per year. That's 20 hours spread over five years. And in each block, we want to have uh, at least 70 species. In urban or agricultural blocks or smaller blocks, um, the targets are only 40. But for most blocks, it's 70. We also want to have no more than 25% possible codes. Those are the, the habitat or singing codes, right? those really don't tell us a whole lot about whether a bird is breeding there or not. So we want to have as few of those as possible. Now the confirmed codes, they're great. We like confirmed codes. 
Um, we want to have at least 25% confirmed, but confirm codes, um, those are the ones where you pretty much have to find the nest or the chicks, right? And that can be tough to do. Probable codes are much easier to find. And if you focus on finding probable codes, you will get confirm codes along the way. Probable codes are where you should put your energy. You get more bang for your buck. You'll be more efficient. So focus on getting probable codes and you'll get your confirmed codes along the way. We'd also like to have at least an hour of nocturnal effort done in each block. Um, there are a lot of birds that are difficult to detect during the day. I mean, have you ever tried to find an owl during the day? It, it's tough. Um, night jars, rails, these are all things that are easier to find at night. So we would like to have at least an hour of nocturnal effort in each block. We'd also like all of the different habitats within a block to be sampled at all of the different breeding seasons. Um, so for owls, this might mean getting out a little bit earlier in the year, whereas for something like goldfinches or waxwings, uh, might mean getting out a little later in the summer. So how can you get involved? You can sign up for a block. Um, anyone can Atlas anywhere at any time. You do not need to sign up for a block. You can Atlas in any block you want to. But for us, for planning purposes, in terms of knowing where we need to put more effort into, um, it's nice if we can have people sign up for a block. When you sign up for a block, you're basically saying, hey, I will take care of the targets. I'll make sure that the block's targets get done by the end of the Atlas. Um, that helps us in terms of knowing which blocks we need to put more effort into and which ones are kind of taken care of. You should also read the handbook. There's a lot of information there. You can get the handbook online at ebird.org slash atlas mddc slash handbooks. It's right here. Um, and if you have questions that aren't answered in the handbook, feel free to contact me or your county coordinator. The email addresses for the county coordinators are all the same. So, or at least they follow the same formula. So you have the county name at, followed by at mdbirds.org. So in this case, Montgomery at mdbirds.org or Howard at mdbirds.org or Allegheny. It, it's all the same. And follow us on social media. Uh, get involved on Facebook. Join the conversation. Um, I'd love to see you there. Thank you so much uh, for listening to this, and I hope that I run into you in the field. <laughs>